Hello and welcome to theCUBE here in our Palo Alto studio. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE with Dave Vellante, here for a special series, Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders, here part of the Cube Plus NYSE Executive Event Series, part of their Wired program. They're putting together a great community. This conversation is with the leaders who are making things happen in the industry. And Craig Walker is here, CEO of Dialpad. Craig, great to see you. Thanks for coming on this uh, inaugural event of uh, the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders. Yeah, I'm excited to be part of it. Thanks for having me. You know, you've seen many ways of innovation, um, you know, prior to Dialpad, founding that one, and then looking at what's happened during COVID, cloud-based business models, certainly in, in the area that you guys are in, collaboration, certainly contact center, have shown to be provide great value, agility, time to value, standard, and change the lives of many people. Now we're in the AI wave. So the expectation of fast speed infrastructure to support new user experience is the top conversation. So I want to get perspective of what Dialpad is doing right now. How do you see the market right now as Gen AI creates another inflection point? It's kicking up to the right big time. Yeah, absolutely. So you're exactly right on that, Arc. So it was, geez, when I used to run the Google Voice product back in, in I don't know, like 15 years ago. And our bet then was, People are going to start working from anywhere, and you got to be able to be untethered from having to go into the office and sit at your desk in order to use, you know, your in order to you know talk it to customers and do all these things and be able to be productive from anywhere. It was just so obvious that the cloud was coming. But one of the last things that was going to happen was that a CIO was willing to put his core, you know, customer success, customer support, sale and just, just collaboration in the cloud because this was like 2011 and you know it seemed very far-fetched, but it was obvious to us that networks were going to continue to improve, the, the quality of the cloud was going to continue to improve and people were going to expect to have more flexibility. So we, even though we were told no one would ever do it then, we kind of bet it that it would happen. So along that journey then we hit COVID, obviously, and then everyone had to have a hybrid or a fully remote solution almost overnight, which played really, really well into a pure cloud solution like Dialpad. And then you're exactly right on the AI. We saw, or I saw a demo from a startup called Talk IQ in 2018, and they did real-time translation, real-time transcription, real-time coaching of a business phone call. And it was mind blowing. Like I had seen other AI, you know, examples at the time and they'd, they'd take a recording of a conversation and then they'd transcribe it and they'd run all this analysis. Then you'd get some analysis after the fact. This company could do it in real time, which was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. So we actually acquired them in 2018 and built them into the core of our infrastructure. So everything we do has that real time AI component to it. and then. Once Gen AI, Gen AI you know, burst onto the scene about a year and a half ago, taking all that training data that we'd accumulated over the last six years and all the models and the learnings we had, and then be able to tie it to a Gen AI model really made like the, the next gen of what a contact center or a sales team is going to look like when they're communicating with their customers or, or prospects. So it's been, it's been two really, really transformative, interesting once in a lifetime events over the last five years. So it's been a really cool space to be in. It's interesting, your market, that uh, that market you're talking about kind of moves inch by inch, all of a sudden it moves super fast. COVID was an accelerator, right. large language models, certainly with text and communications kind of coming together is great. Cloud grows significantly. We're kind of on next gen clouds, what we call it, where you have, you know, from core to edge and now devices, you're seeing that connectivity. Mm -hmm. So how, how has your market opportunity shifted uh, or did it shift and your business model. How do you see that today as the founder and CEO of Dialpad? You're in the middle of one of the hottest you know, areas. It's infrastructure, it's communications, it's collaboration. Mm -hmm. It's also enabling user experience. So has the market shifted? What's your target market that you're going after and what's the business model update for Dialpad? Yeah, I mean, it's always been a massive market in collaboration, contact center, uh, sales and now put AI on top of that. Like it's 140 billion plus market. So it's massive. And I think what the first thing what happened was COVID made every single buyer or every single actor be very open to cloud solutions. Prior to COVID, like you legacy IT or CIOs would be more than happy to stay on prep. 
Like, then what did they care? But now they had to almost overnight embrace a hybrid environment. So that was that was radical shift number one. I'd say the the thing that I'm seeing now is so the market's expanded, and now every business is trying to figure out what is our AI strategy. How are we going to use AI to make our business better? And the beautiful thing about a dialpad type solution is it's one beautiful unified app for meetings, messaging, contact center, sales, collaboration, all in one single code base, one single app, entirely cloud-based with real time built into the core of it. So you don't need to become an AI expert to start getting the benefits of AI for your sales and support teams. We will give you that just built in. You get, you don't need to send a survey of, was this a good support conversation? You get a built-in AI CSAT. Yeah, we have playbooks for sellers of like, did they ask the right qualifying questions? And it'll tell them on the screen what to ask and we'll check off in real time whether they did. And then it'll summarize the answer of those questions. And so, it is just such, you look at it and it's like, if you're a company that's not integrating these types of things into your sales and support you know, organizations, you will be left behind because your competitors are, and they're gonna get better at selling, they're gonna be better at supporting, they're gonna have less churn, they're gonna buy more, and they're gonna be taking it from you if you don't do similar stuff. So it really has just become this incredible opportunity to make these functions that were very kind of like, human dependent on, I hope my reps do the follow my training, or I hope my support agents, you know, go do the right thing and categorize things properly and, you know, say what the outcome was and put it all into the, the right, you know, ticketing system. Now all that can happen on AI and they can just focus on providing the great service to the end user. So it's a really, really exciting time. Yeah, I mean, Craig, what you're describing is so powerful in a couple of respects that I want to probe. First of all, this idea of real time, um, of understanding of, of natural language and the analytics piece. I want to come back to that, but I mean, even when you mentioned this, a kind of asynchronous, listen to a sales rep on a call, go back, transcribe it, analyze it. I, I always felt like, you know, good luck. I mean, the impact yeah, of that is yeah. going to be so much less than if you can in real time, what you just described. The other piece is, I mean, even if you watch like closed caption on TV, it's, it's very much delayed. It's, it's not right. really high quality. Um, and right. so I'm, I'm interested in, you know, your, your core technology, you said you acquired it in, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, there yeah. seems to be such a wide gap between the quality. How is it that uh, you guys were able to close that gap, number one, and number two, the real-time analytics, I'm interested in that. How are you presenting that and in what form in, in real time? Yeah, I love it. Um, yeah, so the, the technology that allows this to happen, so it's this real-time, <laughs> AI, so it's an ASR, so it's so automatic speech recognition will convert speech to text in real time. And we've been doing that since 2018, built into the core of the platform. So what that means is you we now have billions and billions, about seven billion minutes of training data. And all of that training data is entirely on long form business conversations. It's not training data of, hey Siri, play the Beatles or set a timer. It's like legitimately business conversations. So that allows you to have a much more accurate ASR because you're trained on a specific, specific thing. Number two is since it's built into the core of our platform, we can analyze each leg to the conversation independently. So we know 100% who is the customer and who is the agent. And when you're doing things like, okay, what is the customer satisfaction? Guess what? We only look at the customer's leg of that of that interaction and it's 100% accurate because we analyze each feed differently. So having that higher ASR, higher accuracy transcript, then allows you to have a more accurate NLP to do things like sentiment and the high, higher accuracy semantic search. Everything's based on the foundational quality of that piece. And the trick of doing it in real time is kind of the magic because once you can do it in real time, then you can do things like, here's the playbook we want you to follow and check it off in real time as you do. And if you don't, at the end of a conversation with a customer or a prospect, we'll give a scorecard of how you did. Did you ask all these questions? And over time, you know, like as a sales leader without this, you generally would like listen in on a couple calls, see if they're following the playbook. Same thing with support. You support supervisors would sit next to an agent and listen and see if they're doing, but they can literally only 
listen to, you know, like single digit percentages to like hopefully audit the quality. Now you have that in real time analyzing, did this happen? Did they follow the playbook? Did they, you know, did they ask the next right question? Did they, you know, did they properly, you know, properly address the, the customer? All those types of things now is in an analytics playbook or a scorecard for the supervisor of like, here is all the conversations that everyone on your team had like this week, and we will score them from top to bottom by CSAT. We can score them by playbook adherence. We can score them by, you know, other, you know, other qualification metrics you want. It really gets it. You go from like spot checking, you know, kind of randomly dependent on how good your supervisor is to having a coach 24 seven listening to every single conversation and then coaching on it. That's awesome. And then the obvious follow-up is how do you deal with that sort of tricky balance between you've got all this data across you know, a number of different customers and a number of different industries, but I of course want to keep my own data private, but at the same right. time, I want to learn from what you've learned with whether it's metadata on tone and how to approach that, if there's mm -hmm. an angry customer, how do you strike that balance? Yeah, so for everything that goes into our Gen AI, everything's anonymized. And so like they're in all the PII is taken out. So it's very well scrubbed. So nothing can really come out that that would be, you know, that would be problematic. Um, but number two is most of the training data is just to build the model. It's not to give an answer. It's not like no one says, hey, Dialpad, tell me what, you know, what my competitor said on their call last week. Like it's not, it's not like a gen, it's not like an open AI thing. It literally is a model of in these types of sales conversations, here is, here's probably the next best thing to ask. Here's the, you know, here's the sentiment, here's the, you know, proclivity to purchase. Um, and on support, same thing. It's like, okay, this, here's the sentiment. It's not going to kick out any, like any real content. Those are all just model training things, but yeah. And for our customers, even if they're not comfortable with that, they can choose to not have their data even added to those models if they'd like. But yeah, you know, at the end of the day, it's it, we, with seven billion minutes. Some, that's something like thirteen, fourteen thousand years of training data. So we have more than enough. And um, and if people want to keep them to theirs themselves, they'll still get the benefit of all the stuff that's gone in before. It's actually the more data you get, the more conversations, the better the AI gets. I want to ask you about the right. training data because I think this is really speaks to the AI infrastructure opportunity that that enables. The big trend right now is neural networks, vector indexes are huge. You mentioned NLP, you got great linguistics. I mean, linguistics right. language, right? That's word combinations. This is like a beautiful scenario for say Gen AI because now you're moving into this new infrastructure around knowledge graphs, neural networks. I mean, vector index and retrieval augmentation generates the hottest thing out there. That's right. a huge enabler. How do you guys do it? Do you guys vector everything up with the index? How do you, do you do in retrieval? How are you doing the training data and how are you applying that into the product? Well, I'd say one of, the, one of the most unique things about our solution is we own the entire stack, right? So like, and, and it's not just conversations, it's, it's digital conversations, it's video conversations, everything goes into the same thing. Um, the other thing is we built, since we, acquired that wonderful company in 2018. We now have 65 full-time AI, you know, full-time team members who do nothing but AI modification training, updating. And we launched our own generative AI model last year, Dalped GPT, and nothing leaves our system. So we're not, we're not taking a taking a conversation, send it off to a third party, waiting for them to do some generic analysis on it and send it back to us. You wouldn't, one, I don't think that's very secure. Number two, you're not going to get a really precise answer because those things are trained on the entire internet and it's like super generic. And then number three, it's not real time. It's, it's going to have delay. And number four, it's going to be radically costly because every one of those interactions you're paying a third party. So by keeping it in house, it's safer, it's smarter, yeah. it's it's you know more economical, and it's just better. You know, so, example of so, what people are trying to do. They say, "Hey, I'll build my own model, okay, whether it's multimodal or language or both. Right. I'll train it, I'll fine tune it, I'll do reinforced learning on it, 
And then if I need to integrate, that's a specialty model, whether it's big, small, in our case it's small, in your case it's probably a medium to large, but you, have, you got that, that's a differentiator. How do you right. see that interfacing with other models? Because the conversations we're seeing is a heterogeneous data infrastructure layer emerging where there might be value in integrating in with other models for some reasons. Is, is that something that you're seeing where that there is an interface? I mean, we're all connected via API, so you know, we're in a heterogeneous yeah. environment. We see models maybe integrating together. Is that something on your radar? How do you see that? Yeah, it's... Um... Our ultimate goal, and I grew up in Cupertino down the street from Apple Computer. In fact, Steve Jobs lived down my street for a couple of years. And uh, and the thing that I love about Apple is they own every single part of that stack, right? They Everything from the silicon now. And it just works so much better when you have control of the entire thing. So our goal is to always own every every piece of our stack from from you know, the collaboration layer, the messaging layer, the video layer, the AI layer, now the gen AI layer, we want to own all that. Um, there's, But we do have a really, we spun out of Google. I mentioned that I used to run Google Voice. I then went to Google Ventures as their first EIR. They funded us, Rich Miner, the co-founder of Android is on our board. Mm. So we have really close ties with Google. And to the extent there's ever like new features or maybe new languages or things with it we don't have built into our core stack. We do have the, the flexibility to partner with, with Google and their AI engines and their CCAI in order to bring those features into our product as well. Again, ultimately, I'd love to own the entire thing, but oh, yeah. in, in all honesty, I'm pretty sure Google will probably always have a little bit more manpower than us to, to throw at everything. So you guys got a lot of momentum, obviously you've raised a lot of money, I think what, four, $450 million. Um, you, you know, uh, more than beyond product market fit, scaling. How are you thinking about capital markets, um, IPOs? How do you think about that? We had Ali Goetze on the other day. He said, hey, we'll go when, when, it, when it's ready. How, how do you think about it? You know, I'm, I, I think the, the public markets are, are our next step. Yeah. Um, we're, we're excited about it. We're competing for bigger and bigger enterprise customers. We want to be a public company. It gives them more confidence. It gives you a lot more publicity. And it's a it's just the right next step for the company. We all the things you mentioned it are all working really, really well. And it's kind of an unlimited upside on how big this market is and where it can go. And I think we have a real technological advantage. I think we have a real defensible moat. We have a real unique, you know, AI powered customer intelligence platform that that others who don't have that built in for the last six years are now saying, I, I can do AI too. And they're really just sending recordings off to a third party. So it's a it's it's logical. With all that said, we'll do it when we think it's optimal for us. We don't need the money. Um, we're doing really, really well. Um, and yeah, you know, it's it's that's about as, mid, as much detail as I can yeah, get. Thanks for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Fill the beans, come on, share with us, come on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell, what, tell what, are you guys, what are you guys investing in? Obviously, this is just the beginning. We've always, I mean, first of all, we love this wave. I mean, I wish I was 25 years old again, because it's really the most, right. uh, greatest opportunity for entrepreneurship and, and technology uh, problems to solve. There's a lot going on. Um, this is just the tip of the iceberg. What are you guys investing in? Where's the puck going? Because you know you see what you're talking about here. The data you have, you own the stack. You can integrate with others for features. The market will evolve, will continue to shift. Product shifts are happening. You're seeing things like hyper personalized personalization as a trend, right? If you have this corpus, you have this capability. What are you investing in, and what do you see be coming down the pike from an enablement standpoint? Because at the end of the day, yep. the end user performance, reliability, five nines plus right. user app experience is a key, yeah. critical piece. What's next? What's, what are you investing in? Yeah, it's interesting. That, that, that was kind of one of our foundational things. I, I had been at Yahoo, then started a company. We got bought by Google and they were consumer products. And so when you're building a consumer product, it's all about delight and usability and how do you grow pe Like I think you know, Grand Central was the startup that we got a lot of, a lot of credibility for that and that became Google Voice. And so when we approached this, we went from a consumer world to an enterprise world and like we were scratching our heads of 
why does enterprise products seem so painful to use and no one thinks about the end user? So we really, really do care about that. Design's really important. This fully integrated stack is very important. But where are we going in the future? I think the first thing that we're doing is we're really focusing our AI models in, our, in that unified stack on roles and specific models for specific roles. So support is different from sales, is different from recruiting but every single company needs to do those three things. So so that is, that's number one, we're all about that right now. Um, in the future, with that much training data and that much ability to specialize, we'll start going more vertical, more industry specific models. And then, and that's when it starts to get really interesting. Like what does a generative AI collaboration model look like for, yeah. you know, for a medical, you know, company versus a car dealership versus a law firm, and they're they're or an insurance company. They're they're radically different. They're, they have a lot of similarities, but that's why we feel it's radically important to own the model because we can then do those specific tunings rather than just send it off to something that's trained on the internet and hope they give me the right answer. Craig, it's great. Dave and I sometimes call ourselves historians because we're old, been around the block seen many ways of innovation. And you mentioned Grand Central, Yahoo, that was the birth of the web. Grand Central really came out of the, the, the gap that Skype, which was the leading right. thing at the time. Yes, buy some Skype minutes. And you know, that was the beginning. And then obviously Zoom, uh, WebEx, um, Zoom, and then Skype became Microsoft Teams. And you guys are on the scene and you got other cloud players with some, with some call center type stuff. So it's a little bit of right. fragmentation, but the question is the legacy old guard has incumbent position from a leg tech stack, tech stack standpoint. So there might be some technical debt there or not, but they also have to transition. Zoom a little bit came in later in the game with you guys now following after. So you have the new players and right. the old players and, and you know, people don't, a day doesn't go by where I don't see complaints about teams for instance, right? So right. Yeah, Zoom, although it's pretty solid, again, that's video conferencing. Where's the, right. what's, what, how should customers think about when they partner what to look for. I mean, obviously five nines reliability, but as right. those things shift, those legacy players have to get modernized or, and startups might emerge. So your competition right. landscapes there, how you guys see that and what should customers look for when they say, what does good look like? Yeah, well, obviously I have a very dial-pad centric <laughs> view of the world, so I'll give you mine. But when you're, when you're talking about understanding the conversations and understanding the customer journey and understanding everything that's happening with your sales process, your recruiting process, your support process. You want to have a platform that can support all of those and it all goes into a single AI engine and it spits out a single set of analytics. And what you don't want, and this is how we make a lot of gains against those, those folks, is you don't want to have to get one solution for support and then a different solution for your sales team and then something else for your internal collaboration. And and that's kind of the world that that used to be and it should now just be this one beautiful unified solution that you can use in any different application you want any different mode from you know from text messaging social video voice and have that all go through a single engine that understands you and your business and gives you the insights that you need for your business and so you're looking for something that's going to be future proof you're looking for something that can scale and grow with you I mean, this was one of the beauties of, of coming out of Google Voice. Like we had tens and tens of millions of users. Like it was the, probably the most, the largest internet telephony service on the planet. And Skype, I don't call internet telephony because it was all peer to peer. This was literally like interfacing with, with you know, the legacy communication networks. Um, we have that DNA of being able to scale to the largest companies in the world. So, um, I'd look for I'd look for that and look for reliability. I'd look for architecture. I'd look for future proofing. I'd look for built-in AI. And I'd look for a single solution that can handle all my use cases. That's awesome. Well, really appreciate your time as part of our Silicon Valley AI infrastructure leaders series. Just parting question: You know, as you look at scale and AI go together, scale is a big determinant in designing and building these days. AI is going to accelerate. Data is coming on at fast pace every day. And, and so what's your advice to peers, folks out there, other leaders who are, who are zooming out and trying to say, hey, you know, I want to get that scale. I want to take advantage of scale as a competitive advantage. How do you manage through that? How do you build great products? How do you make them perform? And what's your, what's your advice to folks out there who are really dealing with scale 
now. Everyone has to deal with scale, not just the hyperscale yeah. or people with large scale systems. It's a, it, I got to say, it's, it's a real challenge. And, and this is where we're very fortunate to have gone down the AI route six years ago. Um, if we were dependent on, you know, if you're a startup with very little traffic, sure, you can, there's more than enough capacity for you to go use a third party model and, and get off the ground. But you got to understand the limitations of that third party model. It's, you know, it's expensive, it's slow, it's generic. Um, but if you're a company at scale, you know, with, with you know, millions of users and tons and tons of traffic, and you're trying to send all that to a third party, like the the capacity just isn't even there to do it. So so it's a real challenge and it's really hard. And I've talked to I've talked to VCs about this too. Like they have a real hard time like understanding who actually has real AI, you know, yeah. capabilities and advantages and who's just sending off prompts to a third party. And and I think it's a it's a real challenge. It's not like there's a ton of really killer AI teams out there waiting to be scooped up. They've all been scooped up. So, so it's a little, it's, you're, you're constrained on skills and you're constrained on capacity to training models and capacity to just large language models to give you answers. So, you know, as you can do it as a startup, it's wonderful, but as you grow and start outgrowing it, it gets to be a real challenge. So it'll be interesting to see when that capacity constraint goes away. Um, it'll be interesting to see as more and more people like you said, a 24 year old coming out as this next wave, like we'll end up with a bunch of AI engineers, but right now we're kind of in this, the, this scarcity model that's going to be a little challenging for a while. We'll use co-pilots and rely on dial pad, all that good stuff. Again, infrastructure is back, as we've been saying, love to see, this is, uh, reminds me of the nineties, Dave, you know, when we look at what's happening now, that's just a step function change in networking, comms is great. Craig, thanks so much for uh, joining us on the Silicon Valley AI Infrastructure Leaders Program and event series. Thanks for taking the time out of your day. Appreciate it. And congratulations on, on the success. Thank you. Well, thanks so much. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. I'm John Furrier here at Silicon Valley Studio, The Cube with Dave Vellante, my co-host for this special inaugural Cube Plus NYSE Executive Series, AI Infrastructure Leaders here in Silicon Valley. I'm John Furrier. Thanks for watching.